Remember last night we were talking together about an illustration of a uh, hundred dollar note and we said that if I was to give you a uh, hundred dollar note and it was red and I said to you now all you need to do is if you give me fifty dollars change you can keep the rest and nobody seemed to be very impressed with that idea. Why was nobody impressed? Well, because you know that a hundred dollar note is not red and if you got a hundred dollar note that was red, you would know there was something wrong. Isn't that right? You wouldn't have to think about it hardly at all. Let's just change the scenario now and I give you a hundred dollar note. This time it's green. And I say to you, all you need to do, look, I'm feeling fairly generous today. All you need to do is give me back $50. How would you feel about that? You'd feel quite different, wouldn't you? You would think that, my, you know, I've made $50. That's, that's, that's pretty good. But what I didn't tell you is that there were some subtle changes in that $100 note that obviously you weren't aware of because you're not trained to look and see the subtle differences, that actually it was a counterfeit note. Now, a counterfeit note needs to be so close to the real that it deceives, isn't that right? Otherwise, like we said with the red note, no one would be deceived because it's so obvious that it's, that it's a deception. But if it's the same colour, the same size, the same print and everything about it is exactly the same, that's when it becomes very, very dangerous. And if you and I, and most of us here, probably all of us, are not trained to be able to look for the subtle differences in a counterfeit to the genuine because there are some things about notes today when they print the notes that, they, that cannot be counterfeited, but they're subtle things. And for you and me who are not used to uh, looking at notes carefully, we wouldn't know the difference. That is the whole problem that we're facing in the Christian world because now we're talking about physical notes, but I want to say that that's exactly the issue that we're facing in the Christian world. Because the devil is not concerned about a person being religious. Now that may surprise you, but it's true. Atheism in the world today is very, very small. The number of atheists in the world is not very big. In fact, they're so concerned down in Melbourne, they're having a, a convention at the moment this weekend, the Atheist Convention. And one of the things that concerns them is the so few people who claim to be atheists. Um, and even in Russia, when communism took over Russia, the vast majority of people were still religious. Even in communism, the same was true in Poland. Because deeply rooted in the heart of every human being is the recognition that there is a higher power. And it's all very well for us here in Australia and the Western world, and this is the trouble with us here, things are so good. Why do you need God? I've got a job, I've got a home, and I've got security. Why do I need God? So I have the luxury of saying, get lost, God. I don't need you. And uh, I live my life without considering God at all. But if we change the scenario and we put someone who's an atheist, an avowed atheist, or a person who doesn't believe in God, never goes to church, not as a real secularist, and we put him out down there in um, Bass Strait or the, the Bight, down past Kangaroo Island and so forth, and a storm brews up and he's in a little boat, what's the first thing you think he'll do? I can guarantee it. What's the first thing they'll do? He'll pray. I don't care who he is. I don't care if he's never been to church in all his life, but when suddenly life is on the, along the line and we don't know whether we're going to be alive or dead in the next few moments, I tell you, everybody prays. Everybody prays. Because that simply proves that deeply rooted in our hearts 
is the God-filled hole that we all need to fill. And as I said, we can mask it in this country when things are going well. But I want to tell you this, that as suddenly things got very rough here in Australia, if we had a financial crash, a big one I mean, like the Bible says is going to happen before Jesus comes, when that happens, I can tell you this, that people are going to flock back to God, even here in secular Australia. Because if I read the Bible correctly, in Revelation 13, and we're not going to deal with this this afternoon, but I just want to just finish what we're saying here. In Revelation 13, under the mark of the beast, if you read the first few verses of the 13th chapter, it says all the world is going to something to the beast. What is the word? Hmm? All the world is going to? Starts with W. W. Worship the beast. Now, worship is associated with what? Do you worship the Labour Party here in South Australia? Don't think so. Not even the Liberals. No, no one does that. Worship is associated with God and religion. So the Bible is saying that the whole world is suddenly going to become very religious just before the end which is very different to what it is right now at this present moment. That implies to to me that there's going to come a crisis. And uh, if we had more time this afternoon, we could develop that, but that's not really what I want to talk to you about. We're talking about um, the counterfeit. And we all admit that it's very difficult to be able to work out the counterfeit when you're not trained. Now, when it comes to the religious side of things... The devil is into counterfeits. As we were saying, he's not concerned about someone being religious. God, the devil doesn't even concern himself with people going to church. That doesn't worry him. He's not even concerned about people who read the Bible. That's not what worries him. What the devil is concerned about is that we follow the truth. And we get serious about finding out what is the truth that Jesus wants us to follow. That's when he gets really excited. And that's why he will do everything he possibly can to stop us from following the truth. Because the genuine and the counterfeit look the same. On the outward, they all look exactly the same. They use the same terminology. The same expressions are used. And if a person doesn't study the Bible and know this book carefully, you will never know the difference between the genuine and the counterfeit. As Gary was saying in our last session uh, this morning, that uh, unless we follow what God says in his word, we will be deceived. And we're going to talk about this deception a little bit uh, this afternoon as we go on. There are two big issues today in the world that the devil is pushing, two major issues. One is what we spoke about this morning, the immortality of the soul. That is a huge, huge issue. And we spoke about that. The second issue that he's pushing is the fact that God's law has been changed. They're the two central issues that are going to be the centrepiece of the last struggle between good and evil. Remember we were talking last night about the, the great controversy that's going on, the war between Christ and Satan? The last part of that war, the last strategy that the devil is going to use in this conflict are going to be these two issues. The non-mortality of the soul, the immortality of the soul, And secondly, the fact that God's law has been changed. They're the two central issues. I want to speak to you now about the second one, the fact that has God's law been changed. Let me read you Isaiah 24. If you've got your Bibles on, I hope you have, just have a look at Isaiah 24 because this is dealing with the last days and you'll see that from the context. Just have a look at Isaiah chapter 24. And while what we're reading has always been true, Uh, It has a particular relevance for the last days. Have a look at um, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 4. It says, 
The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth also is defiled under its inhabitants. Now, why is it defiled under its inhabitants? Is it talking about pollution here? Well, not exactly. It gives us the reason why the earth is defiled. What's the reason in the next part of the verse? Because they have what? Transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, or ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth. Let me just pause there. God is saying, because they have changed the law, the covenant, and broken God's Ten Commandments, what's going to happen as a result of that according to what we've just read? What does God say is the consequence of that? Therefore the curse has devoured the whole earth. In other words, the final retribution that's going to be meted out to this earth is because people have transgressed God's law. Let me, and to prove to you that it's talking about the last days, let's just read on. Um, verse 6, Therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. What's that referring to, those last couple of lines? Hmm? Yeah, what, what's that referring to? When it says few men are left, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. When does that take place? When are the inhabitants of the earth going to be burned? Yeah, this is referring to the second coming and to the, to the, the, to the thousand years, the millennium and, and consequence of what happens after the thousand years. Isn't that right? And few men are left. Who are the few? Yeah, those who are saved. Few there be that go in thereat. You know the story? So this is referring in a very special way to the last days and God is saying the issue that's going to lead to the desolation of the earth and the thousand years of, uh, of the millennium and all the issues that take place is because people have transgressed my laws, broken the covenant and they have defiled the earth as a result of that. And there's no teaching that more boldly strikes at the very heart of God's government than the fact that his law has been done away with. Just imagine. Imagine in South Australia there was no law. I want you to just think about it. No law in South Australia. How would you feel about going and driving on the road for a start? You know, we may think some of the rules of the road are a bit onerous and with uh, radars popping out from behind trees and all the rest, and we may think that that's very, very bad and onerous, but imagine the consequences if there were no laws. Would you be safe driving out on the road this afternoon? No law. That is, that means you can drive wherever you want, however you want, whenever you want. How would you feel about that? When you're going home this afternoon, no one's observing any laws that is going in absolute chaos. How would you feel about that? Hmm? It would be the most scary thing. I don't think you'd want to drive. Is that right? Would you feel at liberty if uh, the law was done away with like that? How would you, you wouldn't feel at liberty, would you? Imagine if uh, the South Australian Parliament here decreed that the laws... We're just going to live as everyone wants to live. Every man for, him, for himself. The, the survival of the fittest. J just imagine that style of, uh, of life. Now, when the devil hits at the very heart of God by attempting to teach people that his law has been done away with, he is about to try to create chaos. Just like if we did away with laws here, it would, complete, it would bring in complete chaos. And that's really the devil's aim in trying to teach that the law has been done away with. Now 
And it's inconceivable that God could make a, uh, a kingdom without having laws. And he does have laws. And, you know, we judge a country, we judge a place by its laws. Now, we pride ourselves here in Australia of having very good laws. Isn't that right? And I think we do. We may be overgoverned and we may be able to put up a very good case for that. That may be true, but I tell you, the alternative is something that you don't want to consider. We love this country because life here is ordered and structured. Is that right? And you cannot have order and structure without laws. Imagine in a family if you don't have any laws in the family. Kids can just do whatever they want. And some of us have had to endure families with children who have never learnt politeness, barriers, and those children and families are not families that we want to invite to our home again. Is that right? You know, they're running around and drawing over your walls and, and um, doing all sorts of things. What type of, uh, you know, you say to yourself, what, where are these parents not taught these children anything? And all of us understand that. Now, God also has made laws by which he says, if you want to operate and have freedom, then follow these laws. But the devil has come along and he said, no. He's going to teach us that the law has been done away with because he wants to bring chaos. Imagine if a prominent minister of a church here in Adelaide got up and preached that nobody needed to keep the law, that they were restrictive, and that um, these things have been done away with. How long do you think he would be tolerated here in Adelaide? if a prominent minister got up tomorrow and preached that way. Imagine if Pell um, Cardinal Pell um, who's fairly prominent as a result of his last, uh, last week's shamozzle on the TV um, imagine if he got up and preached that in, in Australia you shouldn't keep any laws, the laws have all been done away with, how long do you think he would be tolerated? I can tell you he wouldn't be tolerated at all. He'd be given short shift pretty quickly. Because all of us understand to have structure and to have life and to have liberty and to have enjoy the pleasures of life, we've got to have a structured society. We've got to have law. And that's why God has made his law. If you want to have an illustration of a country that did away with law, God's law, what country would you nominate to me? France. France during the revolution. And I would like to suggest if you want to really have a look at what life is like without structure, have a look at what happened just before the revolution in France. You've heard of Voltaire? And the great sceptic, the great atheist, Voltaire, who uh, predicted that uh, the Bible would become antiquated. And um, if you ever get hold of that book called The Great Controversy, and I would recommend that you, if you haven't got it, you ought to read it. There's a whole chapter there on France in the Revolution. And it there talks of um, how marriage was broken down. Every vice that was conceivable to men was practiced during that uh, three and a half year period. And life was absolutely chaotic. They even changed the days in the week from seven because they said seven represents the Bible and God. And so we are going to change the days of the week. And what did they change them to? How many days in the week? Ten. Ten. And it only lasted a little while because the society couldn't operate under a 10-day week. It's interesting. Just read a little bit of history. That's the best illustration that I can give you of a country in, in, a, in a fairly large way that went about trying to do away with the law. And that's exactly what the devil is trying to sow for in, in our minds today. And unfortunately... 
Unfortunately, I say this, and I don't want to sound critical, but um, we're here because we want to study the Bible. The worst group of people that are advocating that the law has been done away with are Christians. Would you believe that? Now, some of you may find that a little bit um, staggering to think, surely not, but surely truly is. And if you haven't heard it, then what I would suggest to you is you go out talking to fellow Christians about the Ten Commandments and see what happens. And if you mention in that same conversation the Sabbath, you will certainly get a reaction. Because society today wants to keep some things in which they want to have order, but they don't want to be too particular about it. And the Bible tells us that in the last days, this apostasy is going to take a religious garb. Would you come over to Revelation chapter 16? I just want to read you some interesting points here. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13 and 14. We touched on this uh, earlier this morning, but I want to just spend a little bit more time on it now. This is Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14. It says, These are of one mind. Sorry, that's 17. 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs or miracles which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to that battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now the Bible is telling us here that there's a final conflict. If you read Revelation 14, you will find that God has three messages going out to the world, to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. You, you, uh, you're familiar with that and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue and people saying with a loud voice fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth the second angel's message concerns the fall of Babylon and the third angel's message concerns those who worship the beast and his image and finally it sums it up by saying here is the patience of the saints here are those who are faithful to Jesus and keep his commandments you know that those three messages well here is the devil's counterfeit of those three messages in revelation 16 because you'll notice that god the devil has three agents and who are the agents that we've just read about there is the beast the false prophet and the the dragon and they go out let's just read it again in verse um, chapter 16 verse 13 verse 14 for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world so as God's message goes out to every nation kindred tongue and people to the whole world the devil has a message which is going out to every nation kindred tongue and people to the whole world and here is the last great battle that's arrayed between God's three messages and the devil's three messages. Now, the devil has one agency by which he is going to convince people that his is correct. What is the ingredient that we've just read in that verse that tells me there's a special ingredient that the devil is going to use to convince people that this message is from God because of what? Yeah, because of miracles. And I tell you, friends, people are very impressed with miracles. Very impressed. And the devil knows that. And so he's going to use miracles as his agency by which he confirms that the teaching that the law's been done away with is indeed from God because associated with this teaching are these so-called miracles. Get the idea? Let me read it to you in actual black and white so you don't think I'm just making that up. Just come back to 2 Thessalonians and it describes this apostasy in detail. Just notice what it says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And... Uh, here it's outlined in a lot of detail exactly what this apostasy is going to look like. 
This is chapter 2 Thessalonians, not the first. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let me just pause. What was happening in the Thessalonian church was that fact that there were people teaching that Christ was going to come back in the first century. And to give their teaching credence, they were writing out letters to all the church members in Thessalonica, and they were actually forging Paul's signature on the bottom of the letter. That's why he says, even if a letter signed by me, either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as if I've sent you a letter, even if you get a letter signed by me, do not believe that Christ is going to come back in the first century. Why? Well, let's read on. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, that's the coming of Jesus, will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So something has to happen. A big apostasy has to take place before Jesus comes back. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So there was going to be someone that would appear in the church claiming to be God. And then Paul says in verse 5, don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? He was giving them a little bit of a rap on the wrist for not remembering. Verse, verse 7. Now notice how Paul describes it. For the mystery of what? If you've got the old version, it says iniquity. But if you've got the new King James, what does it say? Lawlessness. In other words, the issue with this apostasy is going to be over the law of God. Lawlessness. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So when did it begin? When did this apostasy of lawlessness, this teaching that the law has been done away with, when did it begin? If it was already at work when Paul was writing to the Thessalonians, when did it begin? The first in the first century. I'm not asking you for the year. The first century. In other words, it began very, very early, right? And as we read on... Verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So God can continually to emphasize the fact that the issue is over lawlessness, lawlessness, lawlessness against the law. That's going to be the major characteristic of this power. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, then if the lawless teaching began in Paul's day, when's it going to last right through till? When's it going to finish? Yeah, when Jesus comes and he's destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. In other words, is this lawless teaching in the world right now? Is it? Absolutely. Of course. So it shouldn't surprise us to find that there are people teaching that the law has been done away with because that's what the Bible predicted would be the teaching. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders. What's a wonder? If you were understanding, what does the word wonder mean? Yep, yes, miracle. Something that science cannot explain. It's, it's a wonder. It's just, well, it's unexplained. I can't explain it. That's what you'd say. You'd, you'd read about this and say, well, I don't know. I can't explain it. But the Bible puts a word in front of that wonder, and what's it called? A lying wonder. In other words, it's an absolute deception. And one of the great characteristics that we ought to be looking for when we find apostasy is, first of all, that there will be the teaching that the law's been done away with and associated with that teaching will be so-called miracles. 
They'll be in tandem together. They'll be being emphasised together. The law has been done away with. And secondly, we will be supporting our teaching by so-called miracles, signs and lying wonders. Verse 10, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You know, we live in a world today in which truth is not highly regarded. We live in a world in which, uh, you know, you do everything you feel, if if it feels here good, and, you know, I'm just led by the Spirit and so forth, and I meet people like this all the time. And when you point out some of these things in the Bible to them, they, no, the the Lord hasn't impressed me with it. And what they're saying is that their personal subjective experience is more valid than what the objective word of God says. That's what they're saying. That's what they believe. And that's what they're being taught today. My subjective experience must be validated by what the objective word of God says. Is that true? If it's not, I can believe anything. Because the human heart, the Bible says, is so wicked, it can believe and accept anything. And I've met people over the years in which they have explained away all sorts of things that are wrong. I've had people living in adulterous situations explain it away by saying, well, you know, in my other marriage, we'd never had a meaningful relationship and God doesn't want me to live like that and there's nothing wrong with what we're doing. It's am- I'm amazed at how people can twist and turn their, their, their experience around to justify anything. And that's the way the human mind works and we've got to understand the way the human mind works. And, and it's not just working for some people, all of us are capable of that. To justify whatever we're doing, we can explain away. Therefore, we need an objective test. We need something that we can say, this is the standard of right and wrong. The Bible says and calls that the Ten Commandments. But the world says, no, they're not important. What is important is your feelings. And if you feel good about it, do it. As long as I'm not not harming anybody, you know, you, you hear this sort of talk. Well, I don't read that in the Bible. The Bible says we've got to love truth. There are two things that we've got to balance in our Christian experience, and that is we want to have the joy and the spirit. Of course, we want to be be happy Christians. But on the other hand, we've also got to have the truth to keep those two things in balance. And the Bible says it's the love of the truth that protects me. And that's why, as Adventists, we are very particular about teaching people the truth. Because the truth is very, very important. Because it says here, let me read verse 10 again. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And verse 11 says, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe The lie. What is the lie? Now listen, what's this lie that's being referred to here? What lie are you and I going to believe if we don't love the truth? Which lie? What was the first lie that was ever taught? What did we study this morning? You shall not surely die. And right from the beginning, because these two things are inseparably bound together, these two issues, the immortality of the soul and the constant, um, the doing away with God's ten, uh, law of God, those two things are the, the, the solid plank of the devil's last final attack against God's people in the world. They're the two issues. 
And here they're brought together in uh, Thessalonians. Verse 12, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And that's why this uh, matter of the law is so important for us to understand. Now, we're mature enough, I'm sure, and studied enough, all of us, to know that we're not saved by keeping the law. Nobody is saying that, least of, of all myself. I don't believe that for one millisecond that we're saved by keeping the law. That's impossible. But the law reveals our love for Jesus. Isn't that right? The same as a marriage is not saved just because people don't commit adultery. That's not, that's not what glues a marriage together. Just because I'm not unfaithful, that doesn't mean to say that I've got a happy marriage. Is that right? No. We understand that there's vastly more to a happy marriage than not being uh, unfaithful. There's something, there's an ingredient there that comes that's called love. And the same is in my relationship with God. If I love God, I will want to keep his commandments. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Because the two things go together. But we're not saved because of that. And here in the last days, we are told that God's people are going to be faithful to him and faithful to his commandments. Notice, just come over to Revelation 14. And I just want to read you that verse that we quoted a little while ago, but it's important that we actually read it in our, in our Bibles. I strongly believe in turning up these texts and reading them. Verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You know, it's interesting. If you start to read the book of Revelation, and I'm sure those of you who haven't gone through the seminar that Gary's going to start on Tuesday will be tremendously blessed. And when you get into Daniel and Revelation, one of the things that you're going to notice over and over and over again is the fact that God identifies his people in the last days as those who are faithful to Jesus and faithful to his commandments. The two things go together. You can't separate them. Faithfulness to Jesus... And that brings faithfulness to his commandments. The two things are tied together. And it's interesting, here in Revelation 14, 12, these two things are brought together. In chapter 12, God identifies his people as those who keep the commandments. Chapter 14, chapter 22, all through Revelation and through Daniel, the issue in the last days is over the commandments. And it's uh, also significant that first John, I'm not talking about the Gospel of John now, I'm talking about first John, the little books that were written toward the Revelation, they were actually written after Revelation. Now I know that the Bible wouldn't indicate that because Revelation is written or was in the Bible last, but do you know that first, second and third John were actually written after Revelation? And it's interesting that when you read through particularly 1 John, and we haven't got time to read them all, just come back to 1 John. Let's just go back to the beginning of Revelation, and 1 John and 2 and 3 John are just before it, so they're tucked in there together. Just have a look at um, some of the statements that John makes here in, um, in his book. Um, verse 4 or verse 3 now by this we know that we know him if we what keep his commandments verse 4 he who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him can you see why God's language is so strong because he knows through John John is writing here of the last days because he's the last he, he knows what he's written in Revelation 
He knows the issues that are going to be faced by God's people in the last days. Continually now in all his writings after that event, commandments, 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 because that's the identifying mark of God's people. He knew that in the last days the big struggle in the Christian church was going to be over the commandments. Let me read you some more. Just come over the page, or at least in my Bible it is, chapter 2. And the last couple of verses, I think. Verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. In other words, the evidence that we've been born again is the fact that we want to practice the right thing. We want to do the right thing. And all through this uh, wonderful little book, and I'd like to encourage you just to, there's only, what, five or six, five chapters, isn't there? In First John, I mean, take you 10 minutes or so to read it, just with a pencil. Just mark, every time you come across the word commandments, just underline it. You'll be amazed at how many times in that little book it's emphasized. Obviously, that was an important issue as far as John is concerned, because he knew that we were going to face these issues in the last days and God is calling upon us to be faithful to him faithful to his commandments because you cannot have a government without laws you cannot have uh, a relationship without uh, there being rules and regulations it's not the rules and the regulations that bring love but love must have rules and regulations in order for it to survive and in these last days, God is calling for us to be faithful to Jesus and to be faithful to his commandments. The two great issues that we're facing in the great controversy, this great war that's going on, in Revelation 12 tells us, just look at verse um, chapter 12 of Revelation and verse... Well, we could perhaps pick it up in verse um, 7, I think. Chapter 12, verse 7, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And it says they overcame him by the blood of the the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens. Notice that's plural. And you who dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And that's the only logical explanation for what we are experiencing in the world today, where war began in heaven, that great controversy. And God is counting upon you and he's counting upon me to be faithful. You know the story of Job. Did Job know anything about the story that was going on behind the scenes? He knew nothing. But Job was faithful to God and God is looking upon us today. He wants us to be faithful in this great controversy. Because Satan says nobody can keep your law. You're unjust. You're an unfair God. God is endeavoring to demonstrate before the whole universe that his actions are fair and just. And he has a people who by his grace can be faithful to him and faithful to his commandments. And that's why it's so important for us to understand these issues because God is counting upon us. The God of the stars is counting upon us to be faithful to him. And he wants us to be modern Job's. That will stand for God though the heavens fall. And that type of commitment requires more than just a head nod, head nod to God of a morning. That requires total commitment. 
And God is wanting us to have that type of commitment. And I pray that God will help us to, uh, to love Jesus so much that we are willing to uh, stand aside from all traditions, all issues in our life that cause us to want to walk away from the truth, but we love truth so much that we're going to follow him. May God bless you today. May God bless us all. We all need that constant blessing of God upon our lives because only someone who has that blessing upon their life can be faithful like we're talking about. That's not, that's not human nature. That's superhuman nature because none of us are born that way. We're all born with a bias, but God wants to give us total commitment. And imagine if, uh, if uh, Gary, I was just thinking, imagine if a church this size was able to have uh, its members totally committed to God. I tell you, Adelaide would soon know about Seventh-day Adventists and the truth that they have for these last days. And I pray that God will give us a burden to want to share, to, 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 to tell others about what God has done for us and the issues that uh, are, are important in these last days. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, this afternoon, Lord, as we have discussed so many important issues today, I pray that you will help us to understand and to follow your truth. Lord, we love you. We, we often fail in our commitment to you, and we're so sorry about that, Lord, and I just pray that you'll give us added strength and grace so that we can be totally committed to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his truth for these last days. And we know, Lord, that there's a battle going on, a battle behind the scenes between Christ and Satan. And we want to clearly indicate that we want to stand on the side of Christ. And please, Lord, just fill us with your spirit today and help us to be faithful until Jesus comes, I pray for Christ's sake.